Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I am joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Wambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Wambrew and I are pleased to join everyone today to provide an update on all matters COVID-19 related across the state of Maine for today, Tuesday, August 17th, 2020. Right now in Maine, there are a total of 4,213 cases of COVID-19 statewide. That's an increase of 16 cases since yesterday. Of those, 3,781 are confirmed, an increase of 14, and 432 are probable cases, an increase of two cases since yesterday. Sadly, a one, uh, right now, 127 individuals with COVID-19 have passed away, which is the same number as yesterday, and 3,649 individuals have recovered, an increase of 11 recoveries since yesterday. Right now in the state, there are 10 individuals currently in the hospital with COVID-19, five of whom are in the ICU and one of whom is on a ventilator. That makes our average hospitalization rate in Maine under one per every 100,000 people across the state. To put that number in context, the national average right now for hospitalizations is 15 per 100,000, and our rate in Maine is less than one per 100,000. Among our cases are 941 healthcare workers as well. I'd like to turn to provide some updates on some of the outbreaks in which Maine CDC is involved. Let's start with an update, an outbreak that we just closed this morning, and that is the Walmart in Presque Isle, which ended with a total of three individuals who tested positive for COVID-19. I'd like next to provide an, up, an update at an outbreak that we detected at the Big Moose Inn, associated with a wedding reception that took place on August 7th. As of right now, there are still 24 cases associated with that event, and our investigation is continuing. Let's keep in mind, however, that these are 24 individuals whose lives have been disrupted as a result of COVID-19. 24 people who've tested positive for a dangerous virus. 24 people who were celebrating one of life's major milestones and are now contending with the anxiety that comes with COVID-19. Right now, we do not know whether the outbreak originated at the Big Moose Inn or whether there may have been additional sites of transmission at other points during the gathering. As we've talked about during other types of outbreak investigations, one of the things that we try to focus on is not just figuring out whether there is an outbreak, but what the direction of transmission may have been and where that transmission may have occurred. Right now, we know that there were cases associated with the Big Moose Inn, but we're trying to get more granularity over what the specifics are. What we know right now is that the reception that occurred there on August 7th was a connecting point, and that there may have been other sources of transmission in addition to the reception at the Big Moose Inn. What I think is really important about this situation is that it's another reminder that COVID-19 exists everywhere in Maine and can spread very quickly when large groups of people gather for long duration with high density. Anywhere that people can travel across the state, the virus can travel alongside with them. I ask everyone to remember this situation as you are attending social gatherings of your own. Things like wearing a face covering and maintaining physical distance are just as important today as they have been at any time in the outbreak investigation. What we know about COVID-19 is that where individuals can gather, where individuals can stay and be in close contact with one another, COVID-19 can be transmitted from person to person. I'd like next to provide an update on some of the outbreaks at agricultural farms, agricultural establishments across the state. Right now in Hancock Foods, there are a total of 13 cases associated with that establishment. At the Merrill Wild Blueberry Farm, also a total of 13 cases. 
and at Wyman's Blueberry Farm, a total of seven cases. We're also, as individuals have gone through the quarantine process, releasing them from quarantine so they can resume their work. Just today, for example, 17 individuals will be released from quarantine. As a reminder, quarantine refers to the time period after someone has been found to be a close contact of a confirmed case. They go into a period of quarantine so where they are monitored for symptoms. After their period of quarantine, which is usually 14 days after their last contact with a confirmed case, we can say with biological certainty that if they have not developed symptoms, they have not been harboring COVID-19, and thus we allow them to go back to work. I'd like to provide next an update on matters regarding testing. Let's start with the positivity rate. Based on 1,758 tests reported to Maine CDC yesterday, PCR tests, yesterday's one-day point positivity rate in Maine was 0.63%. The number, again, that we really focus on is not the one-day rate, but we try to take a look back over the previous seven days. That number in Maine, the seven-day positivity rate right now stands at 0.75%. To put that number in context, the national seven-day positivity rate across the country is at 7%, and the value in Maine is 0.75%. Now, in terms of testing volume, we are currently conducting approximately 195 tests for every 100,000 individuals in Maine. And as more swab and send sites get activated and as more folks start using those, what we've seen is a gradual increase in that overall testing volume over the past uh, two weeks. And finally, an update on the number of individuals from out of state who, whose tests have been positive. As of this morning, there have been 194 tests that have been positive among individuals whose residence is in another state. That, uh, that is not the same as 194 people who have tested positive. This is 194 tests among individuals whose residence is out of state. This is out of 5, 000, almost 5,400 tests among out of state individuals. Again, 194 of them have been positive. To put that number in perspective, this is out of 213,000 total tests that have been reported to Maine CDC since we began our COVID-19 activation. So with that, I'd like to now turn things over to our colleagues in the media. Commissioner Wambrew and I are pleased to take any questions that they may have. And our first question today goes to Jackie Mundry from New Center. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw. I have a two-parted question. Um, at that wedding where there was an outbreak associated with it, do we know if there were any relatives or friends that traveled there from out of state? And for anyone who might be going to a wedding or another social gathering like that during this time, what can they do to stay safe and healthy in those situations? Well, let's start with the latter question, Jackie, because I, that, that really is, I think, a key question that all of us should be keeping in mind as we are going to events reconnecting with our friends and family at gatherings of this sort. Now, it need not be a wedding. What I wanna talk about is any kind of gathering. It could be a family reunion. It could be a neighborhood barbecue. I think the two most important things to keep in mind at any type of event are how long are you gonna be there and how close are you going to be interacting with other people? That is to say, what's the duration of the event and what's the density of the number of people that are gonna be there? No matter what those figures are, there are a couple of things that any, everybody can do at any kind of event they're going to. One of the most important among them is to make sure everyone is wearing a face covering where possible. The second is introducing as much physical distance between person to person as you can have. This is challenging, it's hard at all events, but as we've seen, COVID-19 is lurking around every corner in the state. So those are the two things I, I really strongly recommend, is face coverings and physical distance. Uh, based on data from other states as well as other scientific groups, those two measures, when taken together, can reduce the likelihood of transmission. Uh, Jackie, you asked about the composition of the guests. That's one of the things that is under investigation. Thus far, every single person who's tested positive 
uh, that, that is to say all 24 individuals have been Maine residents. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Charlie at the BDN. Yep. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, the first question I have is, um, uh, can you just confirm, we had heard from the hospital in Millinocket that there were 27, uh, excuse me, 28 positive cases associated with the outbreak there. Um, and uh, so is that just to be clear, so is 24 the number Maine CDC is reporting and do you can you confirm anything about the 28 figure? Sure. Uh, so Charlie, you know, this is a good example of how quickly outbreaks can evolve. And, uh, and as, as we've said before, really the numbers are a snapshot of a fast moving train. Uh, I'm aware that, that the regional hospital there did put out that statement. Uh, it is entirely possible that as our investigation continues, we will find additional individuals who have tested positive who are also associated with this outbreak in some fashion. The number that they put forth was the total number that they are aware of who have tested positive. What we're looking at is are there other, other individuals who have been associated with the outbreak who perhaps attended one of the other events who are also part of this group. As our investigation unfolds, the number 24 may in fact turn into 28, but th what they're reporting is the total number of individuals who are positive, what we're reporting is the number that are associated with the outbreak. As we learn more, those numbers will likely converge. Okay, and um, has the investigation um, so far revealed anything about whether people at the wedding or the wedding reception were following state requirements on gatherings and that sort of thing? And could there be any enforcement action against the venue uh, of either of those events? Um, sure. Uh, so I'll, let me start by saying that, that is one of the questions that we're looking into. Uh, that is to say, to what extent was uh, was there transmission, and then to what extent were individuals engaging in some of these things like social distancing, wearing face coverings, um, and, and that's always a question we're asking, partly for scientific reasons, because we want to better characterize in what situations transmission can occur but also, as you noted, for enforcement reasons as well. Uh, organizations that are hosting events have an obligation under the governor's executive order, as well as under the checklist under which they operate to make sure that the environment that they are providing is one that's safe, that guests are apprised of the recommendations to wear face coverings, and that all appropriate public health measures are taken. That's another element of our investigation. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. Yeah, I'll add that we are looking into whether or not this particular hotel was in violation of the executive order that does limit indoor gatherings to 50 people. As a reminder, we have these limits on large gatherings for a reason. There's a good public health reason to try to limit the number of people that are interacting in settings like weddings because the possibility of rapid spread of COVID-19 is greater there. So we are investigating whether or not, whether or not this particular hotel was in violation of the executive order. Uh, thanks, Charlie. I'm going to turn now to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. You say you're looking into whether or not the wedding was in adherence with the executive orders. That doesn't seem like something that would take several days to investigate. It seems like something that maybe one photograph from a wedding could probably answer, um, or at least talking to the people about how many people were there. Are you having difficulty with people complying with this investigation? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, Amy, I, I want to be clear. We, um, when we receive reports of what may have happened, we like to make sure we verify those with primary sources. Uh, that's why we want to speak with the proprietors, the operators, those who were there, and make sure we're not relying on second, third, or fourth-hand reports of what may have happened. And in order to do that, we've got to make sure we're going to the source. Uh, and that's why we have to make sure we take our time document, interview folks, and get a full story rather than relying on snippets of what we may have been told. Uh, it's better to do it thoroughly and correctly rather than, do, rather than to do it quickly uh, in, this, in situations of this nature, especially as we are talking about and contemplating enforcement actions. Uh, so we haven't encountered any difficulties. We have to make sure we're following all the right steps and making sure we get all the facts correct the first time rather than have to backtrack and, and, and correct the record later. 
And how many of the people who have tested positive are symptomatic? Do you, and do you know what counties they're from? Uh, that's part of the information that we develop as we interview individuals, as we learn about what their symptom levels were, what their dates of onset were. So that's part of the process of uh, investigating an outbreak is chatting with every one of those individuals, which is done by a case investigator who inter interviews them, learns about where they may have been, where they may have contracted the virus, what their initial date of symptom onset was, how they're feeling at this time, and then generates a list of close contacts that they may have had who are then passed over to our contact tracers to be enrolled in our symptom monitoring system. So there's two phases of an outbreak investigation. One is trying to figure out where people may have gotten infected from, and then the other is figuring out who they may have potentially transmitted COVID-19 to. Both steps make sure we, both steps take time. And again, we've got to make sure we do it thoroughly rather than just relying on second and third hand advice. But those numbers are showing up in the county tallies already. They've been put on the... Uh, yes, so as our case investigators interview cases, confirm their location of residence, their county of residence, then we do, we do change the numbers accordingly on our website. That's correct. And can you say if any of the people have been symptomatic? Uh, we're not going to comment until the investigation and all the data are in, and we've had a chance to analyze it ourselves. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to turn now to Dustin at New England Cable News. Hi, Dr. Shah. Uh, just following up on the rules for venues, what are the rules in Maine right now for weddings? Are there requirements like hand sanitizer on tables, a certain distances for things, and how do wedding planners set up something according to what's in place right now under the governor's orders? Sure. Um, Commissioner, do you want to tackle this one or do you want me to start? So we don't have specific wedding guidance um, on our checklist for at the Department of Economic and Community Development. Oh. We do have guidance for large gatherings, and that does include, again, trying to keep people six feet apart, wearing face coverings when people are not eating or drinking, using hand sanitizer, making sure like outdoor restaurants, there's appropriate sanitation. So. We um, don't have anything specific to weddings, but we think that the guidance we have for large gatherings suffice for them, as well as other similar gatherings. Is this situation making you think about adding those types of guidance on weddings? So I just want to speak to the fact that we, we think that our guidance has, with the evidence shown this summer in Maine, done well in preventing large outbreaks in most settings. Again, we are looking into whether an indoor reception for over 50 people was what was at play in this particular instance. We don't know yet, but we do think that following the guidance that we have issued about social distancing, physical distancing, face coverings, other types of basic public health measures is what has resulted in Maine having amongst the top statistics in the nation in terms of COVID-19. Yeah, Dustin, I, you know, I think the question we think about when we're thinking about when and under what circumstance to issue, circumstances to issue guidance, the central question is, is there something that needs to be addressed that's distinct and separate from an epidemiological perspective from guidance documents that are already out there? And really, weddings are gatherings. And so the, the basic broad strokes guidance that we've got with respect to any type of gathering applies with equal force to a wedding as it would for any other type of indoor event. I'm going to turn to Lauren Healy at WGME. Hi, Dr. Shaw. I have a two-part question as well. Um, in regards to the outbreak in Millinocket, I'm wondering if the venue took temperatures or asked any questions to guests. And then what are the worries and concerns as more people are going forward with their weddings along with funerals through the fall? Um, so, uh, Lauren, again, one of the things that we're looking into is to what extent some of those preventive measures uh, were taken. In addition to some of the ones you noted, uh, we're looking at whether there was signage uh, to advise guests to make sure face coverings were worn, whether there was adequate space between tables. These are standard things that are not specific to any particular outbreak or any particular venue. Anytime there's a situation, we want to know for scientific reasons, as well as for some of the other reasons we've been talking about, 
what the facts on the ground were. We're always learning more about the circumstances that can generate outbreaks when it comes to COVID-19. And having a finer view of all of these things kind of goes back to Amy's question. We don't just take a look at a picture and say we know everything about what transpired there. We really need to dig into all the facts because two events could look the same in a photo, but actually be much different with respect to the distance of the tables, the type of ventilation, some of the factors that you noted. That's why these investigations take a while. We have to be thorough, so we're characterizing everything properly. Uh, but to your, to your point about as we go into the fall season, any season, as more folks are returning to activities where groups may be gathering, I think it's important to note that any kind of gathering poses some risk. That risk can be modulated upwards or downwards based on some factors that you as the attendee can take into account as well as the venue itself. So for the venue itself, things like ventilation, things like whether the event is indoor versus outdoor, all of those things can modulate the risk. There are things that you yourself as the attendee can do. Making sure that face coverings are worn, making sure that physical distancing is, 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 is kept as broad as possible. Those are ways that you yourself can take control of your situation and reduce your own family's risk. I think the key here, again, is that COVID-19 is everywhere in the state. There's not a pocket or a corner or a zip code where COVID-19 is not circulating. Even if there aren't any cases on our zip code map, there is still the possibility that COVID-19 is there or could be brought there by any of the attendees. COVID-19 doesn't obey zip codes. It doesn't obey license plates. It's kind of like the old visa card. It's everywhere you want to be right now. And so I advise everyone to make sure you're taking all the precautions you can. I'm going to turn now to Brian Sullivan at WABI. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I have a couple of questions for you. If you don't mind, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the contract, the contact tracing in Millinocket, where we are in uh, or in that Katahdin region? I know you mentioned uh, the inn. Um, we heard that the the reception, the wedding itself, actually took place at the Tri Town Baptist Church, I believe, in East Millinocket. Can you confirm that? And also, just other things that you have found throughout the course of this investigation so far. And then I have one more follow up. Sure, Brian. So that's that's the nature of the investigation. Again, going back to Amy's question, we don't just take a look at what we are told and say, well, now we know the whole story. We're always trying to see if there were other elements to the story. Was there a gathering that took place that morning where a number of individuals were in even closer contact? Was there, as you noted, the wedding itself at a church, which we're looking into as well? What types of configurations might explain the pattern of individuals? So right now, 24 out of about 60 individuals were, have been infected. Were they clustered in a certain part of one venue and not in another part? These are the types of questions that we're asking as we conduct the investigation. Right now, again, we've just opened the investigation 27 hours ago. So it's going to take some time to make sure we get all of this right, rather than rush to judgment and say, aha, we have figured out exactly what happened. In order to know exactly what happened, we've got to make, make sure we take a look under every single rock and stone, and that's what's underway right now. Uh, Brian, you mentioned contact tracing. That is, of course, a key element of an investigation. So we'll be speaking with all of the individuals who have tested 